Hey everyone and welcome back to yet another hardware breakdown video where this week we'll be covering some of the most important hardware specs inside of the Xbox Series S as well as diving into the bones of the GPU, breaking apart how capable this console really is. But before we begin, if you're new here and enjoy tech breakdowns, consider subscribing to catch my weekly uploads and if you like this video at all, make sure to obliterate the like button so that way YouTube will actually show this video to others who may enjoy it as well. Enough of all that, let's just go ahead and dive right into the sauce. The Xbox Series S and its beefy sibling, the Xbox Series X, released on November 10th of 2020 as the successors to Microsoft's prior generation two-tier Xbox consoles with the Xbox One S and more premium Xbox One X. It seems just like yesterday that these consoles hit store shelves, but the reality is we are going to be closing in on five years of age for these consoles in a little over four months from the making of this video. The Xbox Series S in particular has gotten its own reputation over the years, so let's go over over all the specs of Microsoft's more affordable budget-friendly console in detail and paint a picture of what it really was capable of at a basic hardware level. Now the main chip powering the entirety of the Xbox Series S is an AMD APU, which is AMD's term for Accelerated Processing Unit, which is a chip that contains a CPU and a GPU on the same die. We're going to start this video off with the former, the AMD CPU, inside this APU, which is the most impressive component within the Series S as a whole relative compared to the last generation and its larger Xbox Series X sibling. The Series S's CPU sports eight custom Zen 2 CPU cores that operate at 3.6 GHz with simultaneous multi-threading or SMT turned off, running a total of eight processing threads, and can also run at 3.4 GHz with SMT turned on, running its full 16 processing threads. Seven CPU cores are used by games, with up to 14 threads being available with SMT on for said games, and one core was always reserved for the OS with SMT turned on indefinitely for two threads total to handle the operating system and background tasks at all times. Simultaneous multi-threading basically allows each CPU core to execute two threads simultaneously instead of just one when SMT is turned off. SMT provides advantages in various ways, but to name a basic few, it allows for better overall core utilization as well as increasing its total throughput. Actual real-world usage is dependent on the specific game engine as well as optimizations, so even even at best, it's nowhere near a one-for-one one doubling of performance when turning SMT on and going from 8 threads to 16 total, and due to said optimizations and some game engines not being as supportive while all these processing threads during the early days of this generation's release, many devs opted for the increased 3.6 GHz CPU core clock speed that disabling SMT provided. Fast forward today and more of these total 16 processing threads are actually being more utilized and available for games, especially when compared to back then but SMT isn't a universal requirement for Xbox games, thus ultimately the optimal approach on SMT being active or not depends on the game's engine design and how effectively it can paralyze workloads and how well it is optimized for. Compared to the Xbox One S that the Series S directly replaces, this is already a massive leap in capability and the largest jump of all the components in the console compared to its predecessor, which I will of course dive into as is tradition at the end of this video, and is even the same exact CPU you inside the beefier, more premium Xbox Series X console, save for a couple of hundred megahertz clock speed difference in both its SMT on and off modes with its CPU. Now for the main star of the show and the component mostly responsible for the graphics of the system, the Xbox Series S's GPU, which was an RDNA 2 based custom GPU that ran at 1.565 gigahertz and had 20 CUs with each CU containing critical elements of a GPU to perform its graphics processing, such as the 1,280 ALUs, or arithmetic logic units, otherwise known as shader cores, which handled all the math and logic operations, mostly crunching numbers for lighting, physics simulations, transforming geometry, etc, etc. Each CU also had four texture mapping units for a total of 80 in the system, which were responsible for fetching, filtering, and applying textures to 3D surfaces, making objects look detailed and realistic in games. Finally, each of the CUs in the GPU also contains a ray accelerator for a total of 20 ray accelerators in the system, which allows for even the budget-friendly Xbox console this generation to support hardware accelerated direct X ray tracing or DXR, all by handling key tasks like bounding volume hierarchy or BVH traversal and ray box or ray triangle intersection section tests, offloading these from the shader cores to massively speed up realistic lighting, shadows, and reflections. Finally, the GPU also has 32 render output units, which take the final pixel data and applies effects like blending and anti-aliasing and write it to 
the frame buffer for display. Aside from just the raw hard spec of the GPU, Microsoft also implements key hardware features and tools to further boost performance of the Xbox Series console's GPUs, such as variable rate shading or VRS, which allows the GPU to adjust the shading rate for different areas of the rendered image. This means that areas with less visual detail can be shaded at a lower rate, freeing up processing power for more complex parts of the image and ultimately improving performance and allowing for higher frame rates, as well as sampler feedback streaming, or SFS, which is a part of the Xbox Velocity architecture and enhances memory efficiency by enabling the GPU to load only the necessary portions of textures into the memory, reducing the amount of data transferred and thus improving performance, especially in games with large open worlds. And finally, there is mesh shaders, which provide developers with finer control over the geometry of 3D models and can lead to increased fidelity and flexibility in creating detailed and complex environments. Overall, these specifications meant that the Xbox Series S is capable of rendering four teraflops of floating port performance, just over 50 gigapixels a second for a pixel fill rate, and just over 125 gigatexels a second for a texel fill rate, and also had a max approximate ray tracing peak capability of 36 billion ray triangles a second and 146 billion ray box a second. Truly a competitive piece of hardware for its 299 MSRP price point at launch back in 2020 for the more budget-oriented gamer. Just as Microsoft intended, the GPU in the Series S is also the largest gap in the console between its bigger brother, the Series X, with the Series X being a little over three times more powerful graphically and pure floating point performance than the Xbox Series S across the board. But that also hints to the philosophy that Microsoft had where games can simply be scaled down graphically from the Series X to work on the Series S, even if some things have to be sacrificed further besides resolutions such as frame rate targets and or graphic settings to do so. And this is thanks to essentially sharing the exact same CPU, preventing bottlenecks that would be impossible to work around, and also not having as deep as a RAM gap compared to the GPU gap. Now moving on, and speaking of RAM, to finally paint the whole picture of the hardware and the performance of the Series S, we need to finish the spec breakdown by talking about the arguably most controversial part of the Series S's hardware, and that's the RAM configuration itself. Now even though the Series S's GPU is a third of the power of its premium sibling, it is still about three times faster than the Xbox One S's GPU in terms of raw floating point performance, and that's before considering any architectural improvements as well as the aforementioned hardware features that I just dove into. Thus, when you look at the 8GB of RAM found in the Xbox One S, you can see that the RAM is the lightest component category as far as upgrades go between the generations. You see the Series S has just 10GB of GDDR6 RAM compared to the 8GB of DDR3 RAM found in the One S. Being only a 25% jump in capacity, Capacity, you can see where I'm going here if you haven't yet somehow heard anybody mention RAM holding back the Series S in any form during its life so far. But one thing I want to mention that a lot of people forget about is 8 of the 10 gigabytes of RAM in the Series S are much, much faster than its predecessor, operating at 224 gigabytes a second, with another 2 gigabytes running at much slower 56 gigabytes a second of bandwidth. For the first few years, 7.5 gigabytes was available for games, versus the Xbox One only having 5 gigabytes available for games. Games. So even though the Xbox Series S didn't get a massive jump in capacity overall, the amount of usable RAM did go up considerably, and that usable RAM is much faster, which I'll break down in my comparison at the end of this video. 512 megabytes of this faster allocation of memory, plus the two full gigabytes of the slower memory pool, were typically reserved for the operating system and background tasks. But a developer could technically use any pool they wanted for whatever reason, but obviously this was the optimal route to go. A later June 2022 SD K update actually allowed developers to use hundreds of more megabytes of RAM from the faster pool that usually was reserved for the OS to squeeze out as much performance as they could from the console. I couldn't find exact figures on this, and sources I speak to outside of researching the far reaches of the internet said that it looks like about all 8 gigabytes of the fast GDDR6 memory is now available for games, opening up the ability to have only the slow RAM pool be exclusive to background tasks and the operating system, meaning the slow memory has no direct impact on gaming performance performance in that scenario specifically, if that's true, but obviously may lead to hitching in background tasks and the operating system. At the end of the day, the Xbox Series S is often given some flack for not being up to par with the Series X and, of course, PS5, but I always found that to be a really silly comparison. After reviewing all of the specs thus far, it's easy to see that the Series S is just a cheaper console option with different resolution targets and graphics and performance expectations than the premium consoles, but still provides next-gen gaming accessibility and the features that come with it without hurting 
preserving your wallet as much as possible. I mean, this console gets all the same games the Xbox Series X gets, and that will also include the upcoming GTA 6 and all of its glory. The Series S obviously won't hold up to any of the other premium consoles with raw graphical output, and it was never made to do that. But when compared to its predecessor, and alongside the lower cost of entry into current generation features, the Xbox Series S is a serious upgrade option. We went from a console that had an extremely slow 8-core, 8 8-thread 8 Jaguar CPU that ran at 1.75 GHz in the Xbox One to a Zen 2 CPU that has 8 cores and 16 threads when running at 3.4 GHz in the Series S, doubling processing threads and almost twice the clock speed on top of the architectural improvements between the CPU generations that give the Series S's CPU a much higher IPC, or instructions per cycle, the true measurement of a CPU's performance, with Microsoft themselves stating the Series S has a CPU that is four times faster than the one found in the One S, allowing the console to hit much higher 120 FPS frame rate targets not possible in the Xbox One, and due to the common CPU bottleneck found in that console, most games were often anchored to 30 FPS, and the titles that did try to aim for 60 often had inconsistencies in its frame rate much of the time, which we don't see as much of caused by the CPU in the Series S. On top of this, the GPU went from 12 GCN 1.1 CUs at 914 MHz to 20 RDNA 2 CUs at 1.565 GHz, resulting in 1.4 teraflops of floating point performance on the One S, compared to 4 teraflops of floating point performance on the Series S. But comparing floating point performance between different generations and graphics cards is like comparing apples to oranges. It actually goes well beyond that at a base hardware level with other architectural improvements as well as more TMUs and ROPs, going from 48 and 16 to 80 and 32 respectively. We also have all the hardware features that didn't exist back in the day on the Xbox One and now available on the Series S to push the appearance of this gap even further. Even with the RAM being only a slight increase in capacity on paper at first glance, because of the increased usable RAM from the 5 gigabytes in the Xbox One to the 8 gigabytes in the Series S and quadrupling the memory bandwidth speed from 68 gigabytes a second to 224, we actually got a bigger upgrade here than meets the eye and helps push performance even further while allowing even more complex game worlds still. On top of this, the Series S could pump out three times the Texels compared to the 40.9 gigatexels per second fill rate found in the One S and can push out 3.7 times more pixels per second compared to its 13.6 gigapixels a second fill rate and also had three times the raw floating point performance that we've gone over while once again introducing brand new graphics technologies on top of it all. Giving anyone with a budget the ability to experience amazing games that couldn't perform up to standard expectation or at all on the previous generation or doing so with major graphical or performance concessions and at least made games run a whole lot faster while looking a lot better than the prior if they did. Personally, I think the Series S is a fantastic console for its price. I don't agree with Microsoft increasing price across the board. It was more competitive at 299 in 2020, at 349 in 2025. It certainly doesn't reach the same level of competitiveness that it did back then, especially when the all digital PlayStation 5 is only $50 more now. So if you don't care about which platform you're on and you would rather higher resolution and higher fidelity graphics, then 50 extra dollars could get you that on a different platform versus 100 in the past. But who's to say Sony doesn't follow suit? I'm not an expert on all that. But I will say Microsoft did have a target audience with this console and from the start they did achieve their goal. But anyway fam, that's all I have for you today. As always, if you sat here this long, especially in this particular video, please shout out down below that you are part of my Ramble Squad. I'm definitely on my straight A Ramble game today in this one. Or just comment that if you have a Series S and what you enjoy about it most or what you love to play on it most and I will engage with you all down there and I look forward to it. I hope you all enjoyed this one. I'll catch you all in next week's video. Until then, I hope you have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on when you're watching this. Peace.